Welcome, my name is Dr. James Zimmerman. I'm the Director of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery here at Sequoia Hospital in Redwood City, California. I've been in private practice here for the last 30 years and today we're going to look at the kind of interventional cases that we're doing closed that we used to do open. Today's patient is a 78 year old lady who three days ago had an abdominal aortogram and lower extremity runoff for popliteal artery aneurysm. She had some uh, vague chest pain and we decided to do a coronary angiogram at the same sitting. She turned out to have a 99% circumflex coronary artery stenosis. At that time, she had a placement of a stent, which was drug eluding. We elected to percutaneously treat her popliteal artery aneurysm. She has a known abdominal aortic aneurysm and bilateral common iliac artery aneurysms, but these are below the threshold for intervention. Her abdominal aortic aneurysm is approximately 4.8 centimeters. She has a popliteal artery aneurysm in her right popliteal artery that's about 28 millimeters. It was felt that we could potentially do her percutaneously while she was on Plavix and save her an open operation. Today, I'd like to show you her films. The opening film is after a contralateral approach to the popliteal artery. And what we have here is a saccular aneurysm of the popliteal artery right above the joint line. To know exactly how large this was, we did not get a CT scan. Our plan was to use intravascular ultrasound to be able to help size not only the aneurysm, but also to size the proximal and distal vessels. When we did her initial angiogram, it was noted that she not only had an aneurysmal dilatation, but the level of the joint line, she had a stenosis. This was confirmed by intravascular ultrasound. The proximal and distal vessels were sized and ultimately we were able to place a Viabon covered stent to exclude this aneurysm. The aneurysm was then measured both pre and post operatively with excellent apposition and no evidence of endo leak. You notice that on this film we have an intravascular ultrasound in place. This is below the level of the popliteal aneurysm. The popliteal aneurysm was about 28 millimeters. The area right below the aneurysm was about 8.5 millimeters. The area of stenosis at the level of the joint line was 3.4 by 3.5 millimeters. The distal popliteal artery was about 7.1 millimeters and the tibial perineal trunk was about 5.5 millimeters. We also used the ultrasound to measure the artery above the aneurysm which was 8.1 by 7.8 millimeters. So this is the view of the intravascular ultrasound. We're going to start in the distal superficial femoral artery, go initially into the aneurysm and into the stenosis just above the joint line, pull back into the aneurysm and then go down to the distal perineal trunk. So when we start this now, you'll see that the artery is fairly round, that there is no serious plaque in the artery and there's no thrombus lining the wall of the artery. As we get down towards the aneurysm, there once again isn't very much thrombus in this artery, and we're lucky with that. The artery gets big quite rapidly, and here it comes. You get a sense that the popliteal artery is quite large. It has some plaque in it, but is not lined by any thrombus. This is more a saccular aneurysm than a fusiform aneurysm, which is unusual for the popliteal artery. We'll be going more distal here in a second through the area of stenosis. But right now we're re-entering the aneurysm to get another look to see if we've missed some thrombus, but it doesn't appear that we have. As we come down towards the joint line, you'll notice that there's a narrowing here we'll notice that this area of stenosis at the joint line measured about 3.4 by about 3.5 millimeters. We'll then continue down to the below joint line popliteal artery, which is a relatively normal vessel at about 7.1 millimeters, and then it tapers down as it enters a large tibial perineal trunk without thrombus that is in the 5.3 to 5.4 range. In our next film, we're able to look at 
the stent which is in place, which is a Viabon stent, it extends from below the joint line, which involves the stenosis, through this aneurysm, which you can see the calcific shell of, back into the distal superficial femoral artery, so that we have a good size match and seal proximally and distally. The stent is then deployed, and you can see the stent vaguely here. It's deployed through the aneurysm down below the joint line. We then went about angioplasting the stent so that it was firmly opposed to the wall. In addition, we needed to dilate that stenosis that was at the level of the joint line. Here is our completion intravascular ultrasound. We see that the proximal aspect of this stent, which is a fabric stent, is well opposed to the wall of the distal superficial femoral artery. The popliteal artery is widely patent throughout its length. The stenosis that was present below the joint line is not impinging on this stent. So here is our completion angiogram. We have normal artery up here. We have the placement of this covered stent down through and below the joint line, and we have continued patency of our tibial perineal trunk. The stent has excluded the aneurysm. There's no endoleak around the aneurysm, and the IVUS has helped us size this appropriately, proximally and distally. Today we saw the advantages of utilizing intravascular ultrasound. Not only did it save contrast material, preoperatively and intraoperatively, it saved having to do a CT scan of a known palpable aneurysm. We were able to appropriately size the aneurysm, we were able to appropriately place the right graft inside of it. Intervascular ultrasound was used percutaneously on this case. It can be used operatively for sizing these aneurysms, and it certainly is a significant advantage to the patient not to have to undergo additional invasive studies. Thank you very much.